Hello and welcome to the Fat Boss Guide to Garrosh Hellscreen, 10 man normal in the Siege of Ogrim. Hello! So you're finally here, we finally are. at the last boss. Yes. And this is a superb encounter, it's brilliant. I think it's really, really cool. It is pretty much, if you want like a basic kind of overview, it's kind of like Ragnaros, Mark II, and Yogg-Saron as well, like thrown yeah, in. Yeah, it's two fights having an orgy, but yeah, it's brilliant. It's, it's a really, 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 really good fight. fight. For this encounter, you want two tanks, two to three healers, and a mixed DPS makeup. However, you don't want to bring more than two melee, um, because there's a few mechanics in this encounter that don't really work well with melee, so you, yeah, don't bring too many melee. Now, as this is an end boss fight, there is three phases in it. Three phases and like an intermission phase. It isn't really a phase, it's more of a mechanic that happens in phase two. But what we're going to do, as we always do, go through each and every phase, tell you what you need to do, what the bosses do, and just how to kill the fucker. Now, to start off, we're going to talk about phase one. Now in phase one, Garrosh really only has two main abilities. The most noticeable one is Desecrate. This will throw a giant axe at one random range member that deals around 150k damage to anyone within 50 yards and leaves behind a desecrated weapon. Now while this desecrated weapon is up, anyone inside like the swirly shit around it will also take ticking damage. Now this weapon is actually a killable mob and as we mentioned about the pool, as the pool starts taking more damage, the pool will actually get smaller and eventually it will disappear completely. Now for this ability, we just had the range stacked up the whole time in, in phase one and just move from one location to another every time the uh, weapon came in and just make sure that you kill the weapon when it does land just so you have enough room to move over to the other side afterwards because there's other abilities in this encounter that do do AoE damage and it's good just to top people up nice and quick and if, if, if everyone is stacked then very easy to do. And in terms of actually killing the desecrated weapon, it has very little health. If you have quite a few multi dotters, you could probably just do that, or maybe just send like two multi dotters on it and maybe one of your ranged DPS. Of course, you don't really want to send melee on it because they have to sit and like in all the purple shit. So probably try and keep your melee away from it, but otherwise, it's not got a lot of health, so it's nothing too much to worry about. Now, the other ability that Hellscream has is Hellscream's War Song. Now, this will give a buff to all nearby adds that increase their damage and health by 150%. So, really, there are a lot of ads which are going to come to you in one second, but when you are tanking all of them and this does come in, you probably want to just try and have your active mitigation up so you're not taking too much damage from this ability. Or ultimately, just chain cooldowns. It does hurt quite a lot. Um, and we're going to talk about how you deal with the ads now, and you can sort of decide how you deal with the Warsong ability depending on how you deal with the ads. Now, there are three different types of ads in this encounter, and the first of which is the Corcron Warbringer. Now when they spawn, there are six in total. They spawn three on the left-hand side and three on the right-hand side. These mobs aren't really a big deal. Um, they don't really do anything. They have like a hamstring ability that will just slow you. But generally, they're not that bad. You just need to pick them up and just try and cleave them down underneath the boss. Now, if your tanks are undergeared and your tanks are getting absolutely ruined by this ability, whatever tank has decided not to tank Garrosh should pick up these adds and tank them away from Garrosh, or at least move them in and out of the boss's melee range when the Warsong timer is down. We just tanked them all on top of the boss. Our tanks didn't have a problem. In another group that we did where we had uh, a Death Knight and a Paladin tank, those guys were taking slightly more damage than when we had a Paladin and a Monk, but Ultimately, if your tanks are well geared, just tank them underneath the boss, everything will die a lot quicker that way. Now another ad that spawns during this encounter on a completely separate timer to the Warbringers is the Wolf Riders. Now one will either spawn on the left or the right hand side that changes, and these guys, they don't really hit that hard, but they have two very frustrating casts that you need to deal with, one of which is Chain Hill. Now this hill, once it does go off, will heal all mobs around him more or less, or everyone that gets affected by the bounce of Chain Hill, for a massive amount of their maximum health, it's like a percentage based heal. And this can actually heal Garrosh as well, and if it does heal Garrosh, you're fucked more or yeah, less. Yeah, it's really fucking annoying. So when this does come in, make sure you do interrupt it, and they'll also do a Chain Lightning ability that's the same as the Chain Hill more or less, except instead of healing people, it does damage to your raid. Yeah. So just make sure you interrupt that as well, it's not too bad, but... Yeah, it's, it's another thing that you need to keep in mind. Now, one other ability that these guys have is that every time that they are interrupted, this guy will increase his casting speed by 25%, and this does stack. However, this mob has, like, no health, really. You, like, you should, everyone should switch to it and focus it down, and because if everyone does do that and it dies really, really quickly, it doesn't really do many casts. Yeah, it'll pretty much only ever do one Chain Lightning and one Chain Heal, providing everyone swaps to it. If you don't swap to it, eventually the Chain Heals won't be able to be interrupted, and you'll be fucked. So make sure you do interrupt it as soon as you possibly can and just nuke the living shit out of it. Throughout phase one as well, you'll also have siege engineers that spawn and these will spawn on the left and right hand side, right up against the walls on top of platforms. Now these are also on a completely separate spawn timer to the wolves and to the warbringers. 
Now pretty much all they do is that they channel into these giant iron stars and if they don't die within 15 seconds, they will make these giant iron stars roll across the room. Now as these iron stars do roll across the room, they do a huge amount of damage, pretty much a one hit amount of damage to any players or any of the um, warbringers that are caught in its little path. Now, when it does hit the other side of the room as well, because it rolls over from one side to the other, it does actually deal 2 million damage to all players. However, this damage is reduced um, by how far away you are from it. So, if you can see where we're standing in the video, like, it's kind of negligible. You don't really notice yeah, if it that much. If you, if you are stood in either the, one of the two locations, the amount of damage you take is quite high. I mean, at the most, it may take out half your health. But you're not taking any damage from any other abilities apart from if you're a tank. So always heal up the tanks after the ability. You don't need to heal the raid. There's no need to panic kill the raid at least. Now the thing is, because two of them go off at the exact same time, they are going to squash your raid if you don't actually take out one of these siege engineers. Now what you want to actually do, or at least what we did, you want to have one of the only one of the iron stars roll across the side of the room. But you do this by killing only one of the siege engineers. So what we did, we killed the siege engineer that's on the left hand side from the perspective of this video. So you can see that's the left hand side of the room and leaving the one up on the right this will make it so that the iron star that would have rolled through the raid no longer does because it isn't charged up by the siege engineer however the iron star that rolls like just behind garrosh will actually roll past him when this happens you just want to have one person in your group to knock back all of the corcron uh, Warbringers into the Iron Star. Now this doesn't one hit them, but it does take out about half of their health. Yeah, so it does. It does a ginormous amount of damage. I mean, not only can you only use knockbacks, but you can also use things such as Mass Grip from Death Knights. If you put like a totem out there, or a mushroom, or even a monk statue out there. As soon as it is coming in, if you if you don't have knockbacks for whatever reason, you can mass grip those targets onto that location, and, it, and then that's also a really great way of killing them. Now these siege engineers at the side have practically like no health whatsoever. Yeah, they have around six, seven hundred k, something like that. So really, the people that you want to send to go kill them would be DPS. But if you bloodlust on the pool, which probably is the best idea because you don't really need lust again until the last phase, and that is a full 10 minutes later anyway. You will have lust up for phase 3 if you do use it at the start. Really, you want to send like a healer over there to kill yeah, them. something like a holy priest or something that actually has a fair yeah, amount like, of damage like a them. heart of the wild druid or something like that. Just something to kill it off fairly quickly. But if you don't have that available at your disposal, just send over a DPS that can get over there very quickly and come back very, very quickly because that's the best way of doing it really. Now this will just continue on until Garrosh reaches 10% HP, in which the phase will then change. Now just make sure that when you're going into the transition that you have none of the war seers, any of the, um, the wolf riders, you don't want any of them up because otherwise you have the chain heals and the chain lightnings affecting the next phase. Not a very nice thing, so if you do know that they're coming in, either zerg the boss very quickly or just hold back and then kill them and then transition. Now immediately as you enter phase 2 you'll be put into an intermission phase that occurs at set intervals throughout phase two. Now these intermission phases, this will grab all players and Garrosh and take you into another realm. Now what you need to do in this realm is kill off any of the adds you see and survive with some time with Garrosh before you're ported back and then the fight continues as normal. Now during the time while the adds are up, Garrosh is gaining energy. This energy will empower his abilities in phase two at set intervals, so you want to make sure that Garrosh will gain as little as possible by clearing the instance as fast as you possibly can. Something to note is that Garrosh will also gain 10% of his health back every time he enters this intermission phase. Now there are three different realms that you can be taken to, and it's important that you know how each one works so you can complete it as quick as you possibly can to minimize the amount of power Garrosh gains. Now the first of which we're going to talk about is the Jade Temple. Now what you're going to have to do for this phase is that you need to split your group really into two groups with both a, a one tank, one healer and some DPS on either side. Now because there are two sets of adds on either side, there's like four on one side and four on the other side, it's good if you can send one tank into both and one healer and everything because you need to kill these adds really really quickly because they do a stupid amount of raid wide damage and just like they bolt everyone and it's a massive pain in the ass so kill them very very quickly. Now afterwards what you'll do, you'll both channel into the middle you all run into the middle tunnel and quickly clear out them and then you'll split up once again to go and kill either um, add pack on either side so it's it's quite simple how you have to do it now when you kill any of these adds um, they have a chance of dropping a golden orb and this is the same for all of the phases now if you run over this orb 
it will give you a debuff that actually reduces the amount of damage you take. So it's a good debuff, in yeah. all fairness. Now, it is important that as many raid members as you possibly can to get this debuff. Uh, you need as many people as you can get to get this because the damage in the second part of this intermission phase is actually pretty high because Garrosh is just going crazy doing AoE on you. However, you should never really go out the way to pick up one of these orbs if it means that you're going to complete this phase slower. Even if it's by a second or two, it's very, very important that you don't go all the way over to one side just to get a buff. Now, some orbs can actually be collected by multiple people at once. Now, as so, um, considering as there aren't enough orbs to go around in any of the phases, really, uh, maybe one of the phases, but basically, if you stand in the positions that the orbs will spawn, you and everyone else that is there will actually gain the debuff. Now, you can actually see where it's going to spawn because there's a little swirly pattern on the floor. It's not always easy to get to, and it, to be honest, it isn't something that you should massively worry about, but I feel in Heroic, if you're not going to be doing this, you're going to probably be dying in the so second phase. So it's, it's probably good to get into the habit of picking it up. Yeah, but it's not like the end of the world. Oh, I haven't got the debuff, let's wipe or anything like that. Like, we've done it before where, like, pretty much one or two people have got the debuff. and we've Or even none phase. sometimes, yeah. so... It's fine. Now, once all the ads are completely dead in the Jade Temple, you actually get to fight Garrosh. And wherever you fight him, he always does the exact same thing. He just spams Annihilate. Now, this Annihilate is like a frontal cone ability that will just be targeted on any player that's inside the room. Now, if you get caught by this ability, it will do 3.5 million damage. Yeah. So do not get hit by it. However, every time that it does land, it will deal 360k damage to everyone in the raid, sort of like a general AoE. Yeah. So that's why it's very, very important that while you, you do have Grosh active, that you stay as close to him as possibly can, because then the cone will be a lot smaller and you'd have to move a lot, lot less. And obviously that means you can start using your AoE heals. So you can use your, your Resto Druid Shrooms, your Holy Priest shit, your Healing Reigns, all that sort of stuff. Um, just stay clumped as much as you possibly can and obviously don't get hit by this cone. It is actually quite important that when you are doing this in Lilate phase, you do save raid-wide damage reduction cooldowns because you do actually need them in phase two. Well, it's very helpful. If shit is massively hitting the fan and it's clutch, you, you might as well use it because you yeah. probably If you have to use cooldowns yeah. because you're going to die, then use the cooldown. Otherwise, you should try and not use any cooldowns in this phase. Really, if you're on top of the healing, then it's very easy anyway. It's not too much to heal. After 9 Annihilates, you will go back into Karosh's room and you'll continue phase 2. One thing to note, when you do go back into this phase, you lose your um, damage reduction debuff. That's only for that little room. Now, we've explained the Jade Temple. Now, there are two actually other intermission phases. Now, another intermission phase you can have is Terrace of the Endless Springs, more or less. It, it looks look, like It's it. like the Shah of fear heroic encounter area. What you'll need to do is run straight up. You don't need to split up your raid here. You don't need to cover different sides. Just pull as many of the mobs as you possibly can and just keep running straight up towards um, where Garrosh is. Now, every time one of these ads dies, they have a chance of dropping the orb. Um, but these orbs are very, very small and pretty much only one player can pick them up at the same time. So don't really worry about picking these up too much. Um, and when you do get to the top, try and bring everything up to you. Don't slow anything. Never slow anything because it will slow down the speed at which you kill this place. But this is like the easiest one. Yep. This is like the fastest one. Run straight up to the top. AOE will down all the mobs on top of each other. And then you'll have Grosh. And Grosh works exactly the same way in every single intermission phase that you'll have. So just again, deal with the nine annihilates and then you'll be sent back out and you'll continue with phase two. Now the third potential place that you can get is like the Temple of the Red Crane, if you remember doing that quest down. In the Karasarang Wild, uh, yeah, wherever um, it is. It doesn't really matter where it is. Either way, what you'll do is that you actually once again need to split your group back into like two separate groups and run down the stairs. One group will go to the left hand side, one group will go down to the right hand side. Now you have to deal with some a very, very big ad on either side of the stairs that does hit very, very hard. It hit one of our plate wearers once down to like 10% with one hit so you want the tank to pick that up um, so try not to engage it until the tank does get there or you can safely pick it up once you have. Now once you have killed this ad a massive orb will drop out of it and it, it seems to have quite a slow traveling time so everyone has enough time to pick up the uh, damage reduction that you'll receive out of it. However there's a really nasty thing that Garrosh seems to do. As soon as the ads die the boss almost becomes active immediately. And now if this orb spawns up the stairs, which is the opposite direction of Garrosh, and you get targeted by the Annihilate as you're picking up this orb, there's nothing you can do about it. You're just gonna get hit by the Annihilate. So every time this orb does spawn, 
we have a habit of just completely ignoring it. Don't go and pick up this damage reduction, because sometimes Grosh will just activate too quickly and annihilate you immediately, and there's nothing you can do about it because you're sort of stuck in a corridor. Take nine annihilates from Grosh, and then you'll go back into phase two. Now we've actually explained all the intermission phases, we're actually going to explain what Grosh does in phase two, and luckily it's actually fairly simple what he does. He does actually have four abilities in this phase. Now all of these four abilities will have empowered versions once he gains a certain amount of energy, which he gains through the intermission phases so of course the quicker that you can clear them the better now the first ability that he has is whirling corruption now this just deals very large amounts of raid damage now this is where you want to use your raid cooldowns that i said that you want to be saving but the thing is the further away he is from the raid the less damage it takes now that doesn't mean tanks go to china with him or anything don't take him very very far away you just want to be moving in probably to maxed um, healing range or just somewhere off around that sort of area that'll make it so it doesn't do a ridiculous amount of damage to you but otherwise yep just use your raid cds for these and you can't really do anything about it now when Garrosh's energy does go above 25, that will empower this Whirling Corruption ability and will cause the ability to also throw projectiles at players' feet that deal 200k damage in an 8 yard area. Now when these explode, it will also cause a minion to spawn and these minions hit extremely hard. Now when these adds die, they'll cause other adds nearby to be healed to full and it will increase their maximum health by 200% and their damage by 200% and this is like a stacking thing. Yeah. So when this ability is empowered, which it will be probably after your second intermission phase, um, because that's when your corruption will probably be around that level, you need to make sure that you do spread out while this whirling corruption is going on, and because you're not stacked up, it makes healing a little bit harder, especially if people like accidentally get hit by the uh, random purple swirly projectiles that land on the ground. Um, so make sure that you do use a healing cooldown when, when this happens and obviously with the adds don't stand on top of each other and never kill them near each other um, because these adds can become extremely dangerous and can start almost one hitting random people. One problem we had while we were sort of progressing on this is that the tanks were getting aggro on these adds. It's very very important that the tanks do not tank these adds because not only does it make them difficult to kill because once they're on the tank they're not really ever going to get off the tank but if they're all clumped up they all just keep healing each other and become even more and more powerful. So make sure that you don't pick them up as a tank, just leave them. And if th there is like one on the tank, then the tanks can just blow it up immediately. But apart from that, they're relatively simple to deal with and it's not too problematic. Another ability that Garrosh has is Touch of Your Charge. Now this will mind control two players. Now these players, all they will try and do is cast an ability that causes other players to become mind controlled. They won't just start doing giant AoEs and all this sort of annoying crap. They'll literally just constantly cast an ability that causes other players to become mind controlled and then they'll start casting. So it, starts, it spreads like a virus. Now the mind control will leave that player once they have been reduced down to 20% of your maximum HP. So they do need to be nuked down. But the thing is, you need to interrupt these players or CC them. Now, because they are just trying to spam this cast, if you do not interrupt them, then it will be a wipe. You can very quickly be overrun. It did happen to us a couple of times, especially like if someone's really stood miles away from the raid and it happens and you're just, you're just thrown off, then you are going to struggle. So make sure that these players, you do nuke the living shit out of them. You can stun them and you, you can use pretty much all forms of CC. So just do that. Now, although you can just completely explode them, be careful with your dots. Like if you're going to just like combust on them, I wouldn't recommend it because that'll stay afterwards and you'll kill some people. So do be careful about that. Now, when Garrosh empowers this ability, when he hits 50 energy, he'll actually cause all of the um, mind control players to become empowered versions of themselves. Now, this just makes them turn into a shard that is immune to all effects that will cause any loss of control. So no stuns. The yeah. only way you can stop the mind control spams going out is if you interrupt the cast. Now you shouldn't really be looking at having Garrosh empowered to this degree until phase three. If your DPS is high enough, that is possible. But if it does happen in phase two, you just need to deal with it. When people are mind controlled, it's so important that everyone switches, including the tanks if you can. If you can move the boss um, so it's on top of a mind control target because you know that the whirling corruption isn't coming in anytime soon and it's safe for you to do so, then you should. The quicker you kill people, the better it will be, the easier it will be. Now, Garrosh has actually retained one of his abilities from phase one, which is Desecrate. So he basically exactly the same before. He'll just throw a giant like polearm or axe or whatever it is at you um, and you can kill it to uh, remove it. However, in phase two, we don't actually bother killing it. Your DPS in phase two is a lot better on Garrosh. The only time people would ever do damage to these weapons was just to minimize the size of the pool so we've got as much room as we want um, for phase three because that's all you're doing in phase two you're just filling up the room with weapons 
trying to make sure that all the weapons land like as far away from the middle of the room as possible just keep them clumped up against the, the side so you have more room and just do enough damage on them so their pools decrease in size so you have far more encounter room to play with now the thing is when garrosh empowers this um ability when he hits 75 energy you can just you can't kill the weapon the weapon becomes indestructible it just constantly has loads of health regen you just can't blow it up so to be honest it's kind of the same as what you do in phase yeah, 2. Yeah, for honest. this particular tactic, it's irrelevant. If he does reach 75 energy, it's not a big deal. And really, if you do the encounter properly, you'll never reach 75 energy. Now, during phase 2, for the tanks to worry about, is an ability called Gripping Despair. This is a dot that's applied to the tank that deals a 30k tick every few seconds, and it does stack. We always taunt it around the 3 stack mark, However, we did get problems with Garrosh going Taunt Immune around this mark, but they will actually drop if you do Taunt on 3. So sometimes you might want to leave the boss a little bit longer, and also something to note is while the boss is casting his Whirling Corruption, if a tank does have stacks, those stacks will drop during the Whirling Corruption because the boss will no longer melee hit. So if the Whirling Corruption has just started, the tank shouldn't swap, even if one of the tanks is on 4 or 5 stacks, because it will just drop. One thing to note about this debuff is that when Garrosh does reach... 100 energy which should never ever ever happen in phase two uh, it does happen in phase three so it's important that you understand how it works now that when the debuff drops like on the tank it will cause explosive despair which makes the debuff explode dealing like damage equal to the value of the gripping despair so if you have three stacks which is taken for like 90k when the debuff drops you'll take like an extra explosion yeah exactly damage. it just means that the tanks take more damage when the debuff is about to drop you might need to pop a cooldown depending on how high your stacks really are but the thing is, each time you take an explosion from this, so each time your stacks drop, you get a new stack that will make you more vulnerable to these explosive despairs by 10% per stack of gripping despair that was used up. So say I did have five stacks and then that exploded, the next one will do 50% more damage to me. So this is really a phase three mechanic. If you ever see it, then you're pretty much on a wipe territory anyway in phase two. But in phase three, in all fairness, it doesn't last a huge amount of time. But like tanks do be aware that when your stack is dropping, you're going to be exploding for higher and higher amounts. So what you want to do throughout the whole of phase two is make sure that you stack up for all the whirling corruptions until they do become empowered when they're empowered you need to make sure that you spread out for them you need to keep your eyes on the timers for the desecrates and try and place them like it, as much as you possibly can towards the walls of the room you want to deal damage to them so that they shrink in size and essentially you just want to make it so you have as much room as possible throughout the encounter area so you have as much room as possible for phase three as well as making sure that you interrupt and taunt on around three to four stacks now once you bring down Garrosh to 10% HP, he will enter phase 3. Upon entering phase 3, he will heal up to 25% of his health and have 100% of his energy, which means all of his abilities that we mentioned previously are now empowered, which means that you now have to deal with the, the empowered weapons, which means you can no longer kill him from the Desecrate ability. You'll have to deal with the Gripping Despair, which is the new debuff on the tank. Mind Controls can only be dealt with by interrupting, and we'll talk about this in a minute. And the Whirling Corruption, you can't really stack up for it. You'll get all the little explosions that spawn on the ground and the ads that spawn out of them. So this phase is just one big sort of clusterfuck, really. Yeah. It's all about watching timers and knowing when things are coming in. If a Desecrate is placed in a really bad position, you can't kill it. Nothing, None of the weapons can die in this phase. So it's very, very important that if these do spawn in a bad place, that everyone repositions um, so that they're relatively nearby. And the main reason why you need to stay quite close to each other is because of the mind controls. Because people can only be interrupted and they can't be stunned or knocked back or anything like that during this phase, it's extremely vital that you set up some sort of either interrupt rotation or all of your players are very, very good at communicating over vent or mumble or whatever voice communication software you use. Because two people get mind controlled, if they're sort of the people that you were like relying on to do interrupts, they need to communicate with other people and say, look, you need to interrupt. And really, they should never really do more than two casts. So you need two interrupts per person, which is obviously four interrupts total. But really you want six people within the rotation because any of those six people could also be mind controlled. And really you need to work out and call out when you're interrupting and who is interrupting and just rely on them to do it. But if one of them fails, that means you're going to have to deal with another person who's mind controlled, which means you then have three people to interrupt. Yeah. And it just grows, and it grows so quickly, and you can wipe so quickly from that ability. This is the hardest part of this phase, really. 
um, is just dealing with those mind controls. But providing you can deal with them, the only other problem you have in this phase is just the healing from the whirling corruption. If people don't stand in the little puddles on the ground and the boss isn't tanked too close to the raid, you won't have a problem. And obviously Bloodlust is up for this phase, and this phase doesn't really last that long because the boss is already so low. It's like a race against the clock because the room will be filling up because obviously these weapons are taking up so much room and everyone's moving about all over the place. You, one little mistake and it's a wipe. Yeah. So providing you understand all those abilities, it's relatively simple. So thank you guys for watching. If this guide did help you out, then please do give us a like. It helps us out a lot. And make sure to comment, rate, and subscribe. And if you'd like to see more 10-man normal guides by Fat Boss in the Siege of Agama, please do click up on the screen now on the annotations, and it'll take you straight to those videos. Thanks for watching. Thank you.